So hi everyone and welcome to this video on testing for cointegration using the Johansson test. So uh, before we get into a formal module on the vector error correction model, I think it's important to understand okay, where cointegration is coming from. And uh, to do that, it's important that we know if cointegration exists in our system, i.e. a linear combination of our uh, non-stationary variables could potentially be stationary. So uh, we're going to try to test for cointegration in this video, and we're going to use the Johansson test to do that. So uh, let's start. So to formally be able to run the test, we're going to use something inside of the Orca library or the Orca package. So we need to install that. I have it installed on my Mac. So uh, if you don't have it installed, you use the install.packages command. But since I have it installed, I'll just call it using the library command. And then we're also going to use forecast and tidyverse for this case. So again, our first step is we need to load the data set. Okay. So the, the data set and the codes will be linked in the description box below in case you want to uh, replicate it for yourself. So let's call our data set data. And uh, it's a CSV file. So we'll use the read underscore CSV command and then file.choose okay then it's inside one of these folders and that's vecm lecture notes okay so uh let's just see the first few rows of the data set so uh head data okay so we have uh those data points here now uh we're just gonna use three variables for our case here okay so uh, we're going to use three variables and we need to declare okay each variable as a time series object so we're declaring time series objects and uh, the three variables that we're going to use are the log of gdp the log of cpi and the log of m3 money supply so let's call the log of gdp as gdp then it's ts okay so from data we're getting ln gdp okay then uh the my data set okay it starts at uh, the first quarter of 2003 okay and uh since it's quarterly data of course frequency is equal to four and we do that we have our object there then we're gonna do the same for uh cpi and for uh m3 money supply so this is cpi okay so this is ln cpi okay so this should work and we have lastly m3 and then we have here ln m3 okay and that should work as well so we've created our three time series objects and uh we put uh the next step is essentially okay since we're building a model okay uh we need to uh, put these three variables in a system so we need to bind into a system and to do that we're gonna use uh we're gonna create an object called d set Okay, and to bind, we're going to use the cbind command. So cbind, okay, and uh, we're going to bind GDP, CPI, and M3. Okay, so M3, and that binds it into an object. So we can see the object here. Okay, then after that, we're going to go formally to our lag selection uh, criteria. Now, under a Vecam, remember that the lag selection is quite different in that you have to subtract one. Okay, assuming that there's a co-integrating relationship, of course, that you need to subtract one from the lag order determined using the regular VAR technique. So we're going to do that. So lag selection criteria. Okay, then, uh, so uh, to try and test for lag selection, we're going to use the, uh, we're going to create an object lag select. Then we're going to use the VAR select command. Okay, then we're going to run that command on our binded system, which is D set. So let's set a, log, a lag map, say, equal to 7, okay? And it's just a typical uh, lag selection. So constant, const, oh, sorry, constant, const, okay. Then that should run. Then we need to uh, check okay, uh, how many lags to use. So uh, lag select, dollar sign selection. And uh, we see that five appears most often. So the Han and Quinn and the uh, final prediction error uh, think that five lags is optimal. So since five lags was optimal, so since 
5 was chosen, okay, we use 5 minus 1, which is equal to 4. So the lag order that we're going to use would be uh, 4 lags in this case. So uh, now that we have our lag selection done, we can move on to specifying the Johansson test. So uh, there are two variants of the Johansson test. Uh, uh, the first one is the trace statistic approach, and the second uses the maximum eigenvalue approach. And conveniently, the command that we do or that we run the Johansson test supports both of these types of approaches. So the most common one is the trace statistic approach. So let's start off with that. So uh, I'll now go to the um, Johansson, te Johansson testing. Okay, so this one uses the trace statistic approach. So I'll create an object C test, okay, C test 1T. Okay, and essentially, okay, uh, the command to do the Johansson is ca.jo. Okay, uh, then we're going to run the test on our system, which is in D set. Okay, and then the type specifies whether you want a maximum eigenvalue or a trace approach. In this case, we're going to use a trace approach. Then let's say our model, okay, uh, the model that we're going to specify, it includes some intercept or some constant. So we're going to add that constant. Then we're going to specify K, which is the lag order that we determined, and that's equal to a uh, lag order of four. Okay, so we can run that now. And then uh, we can see the results of that test using the summary command. So C test 1T. And we have our results here at the bottom. Now, uh, the most important part of that test is this one, okay, and we can interpret it now. So we can see there are four columns of interest here. We have a test column and uh, and three other columns which pertain to critical values at a 10% significance level, at a 5% significance level, and at a 1% significance level. So for our case in social sciences, we're just going to typically use the 5%, so I'll defer to that. Okay, so... We have here a column of R, and R represents the rank of uh, the, your, your error correction terms matrix. And essentially, they pertain to potentially how many co-integrating relationships there are in your system. So the way that the test carries it out is actually quite simple. So for example, okay, when R is equal to zero, so that's the bottom row that we have here, Okay. The test statistic is equal to 117.30. And we note that that 117.30 is greater than the 5%. Again, we're going to use the 5% defer to that. Uh, is great, uh, is uh, less than the test statistic. So 117.3 is greater than 34.91. And in, uh, in this case, we see that, uh, that uh, for, for this case, when R is equal to uh, zero, okay, when R is equal to zero, uh, it means that we reject the null hypothesis, which suggests that there is at least uh, one co-integrating relation because uh, the null hypothesis, the alternative hypothesis states that uh, it's uh, R is greater than whatever this number is. So since we reject this hypothesis, we state that R should be at least one. Okay, now we can move on to this one. We're in our, the second row and we see that 29.53 is still greater than 19.96, which means that we also reject the hypothesis that R is uh, less than or equal to 1, which means that R is greater than 1. Okay, so that would mean that there are at least two co-integrating relationships in our system. Now we have finally uh, R is less than or equal to 2 and our test statistic is 7.89 and we have our 5% test statistic here being 9.24 and uh, what we see is uh, that uh, the test statistic is lower okay, than the 5% uh, critical value which means that we fail to reject the null which means that uh, we take this that it's less than or equal to 2 meaning there are uh, at most okay, two co-integrating relationships present. So in this case, the Johansson test is saying to us that there are at least two co-integrating relations in our system. 
Now that's the trace approach. Let's see if we uh, get the same result uh, using the maximum eigenvalue approach. So max eigen. So uh, we copy that. And the only thing that will change here, so we'll change the name of the object. Let's change this from T to E. Then this one will just go to eigen. Okay, so we're going to specify an eigen type. And then this is C1, C test 1 E. And we can see uh, we can see that uh, the results sort of changed a bit. Uh, it's 87.77, but we can see uh, that uh, the implication is pretty much the same. So we believe that there are uh, there is at most uh, two co-integrating relationships because we fail to reject this hypothesis here. So that's a simple video on uh, co-integration or testing for a co-integration in R, and I hope that you're going to be able to apply it once we get to the vector error correction model. Thank you for your attention.